Hey guys, Joe Pye here at Advanced Innovations. Welcome back to the shop. We are going to focus on part number 12. That is the tool slide that holds the slide block, that holds the tool post, that holds the clapper block, that holds the tool bit, that ultimately cuts the part. We are getting very close to, speaking of cutting parts, not having any parts left to cut. All the red lines are parts that are checked off the list and I am really looking forward to the assembly video. So for now, we're going to go over to the mill. I'm going to pop a piece of brass in there, and we're going to make this little guy right here. Let's get to it. When you use a square collet block and you intend to rotate it to a 90-degree position, pick a reference point. I use the set screw. That way I know the set screw always goes to the left or the set screw goes up. Simple. Here I'm just indicating the part so that I can do the following mill work and be on center. Following the semi-finished passes with the dovetail cutter, the only way to really determine where you are is to lay your pins in there and check it with your mic. Once you know how much more of an offset you need to make, make the offset, make the finished cuts. With the V complete, I can now take the square collet block and lay it horizontally in the machine and maintain my vertical reference and center line on the Y axis. I have to put a threaded hole in here. I believe i got to square off these ends. I'll probably do that first. And then we'll lay it down. Pick up this face. Move in. And put the threaded hole in. Lay it down, put a threaded hole in it, and back turn the smaller diameter. Okay, now to everybody watching and possibly the guys at PM Research, this is called out as a 256 thread all the way through this. This is a half an inch long, 0 0.500 decimal inches, 12.7 millimeters for all you uh, metric people. If your tap does not have sufficient teeth to go all the way through this, run the tap in as far as you can and then counterbore the opposite side. 
Just make note of what side of the part has the teeth and what side has the counterbore. Make sure that the threaded side goes towards the screw that comes in and the lead screw should pass through this part without incident. Let's tap it and find out. It's looking like it's going to fall short of the required 500 depth. And I'm just being nice. It's definitely going to fall short by about 4 millimeters or more. Let's grab the mating part and see what we get. Well, I would say based on the fact that that thread is buried in that part, there is no reason to counterbore the other side. You run out of usable thread before you run out of depth. That's a good thing. Okay, we'll move over to the lathe, undercut this part off, and we're done. Now there's a feature that I want to put on here that is not on the print and anytime you have a set screw, a grub screw coming down and making contact with a rotating surface, it's going to mar that surface. And once it's indexed or spins or moves to a new location, whatever mar you have in that OD is going to translate to the ID of the mating part and before you know it, you're going to have chips floating around where chips shouldn't be floating around and it's going to get ugly. Ideally, there should be an undercut right here to accept the screw so that when the screw goes down and hits this diameter, it damages the undercut and not the locating feature. So I'm going to dig up a tool and I'll be right back and we're going to put that in there. I'm going to use a parting tool to put this little groove in and it is biased to the front this way by design. That way when the set screw hits the incline of the groove, It'll reject the part this way and pull it tighter against the inside locating face here. At least that's the plan. Superficial groove should be all you need. Okay, let's take a look at the part before we move on to the next one. Now 
if the cutter that you use or select doesn't have sufficient cut length edge, then you can do what I did here. I did have a adequate length, but I decided to put a couple flats on there just to keep yourself from cutting yourself on it. Undercut. Let's take a look at where that goes. That goes right in the front of the ram here. When the screw is secure, it does draw it nice and tight to the face. And it is relatively secure. Now, if you want to adjust this, guess what you have to do to that? <laughs> Wait for it. Unloosen this screw right here. See that? Yeah, I haven't heard that in a while. And this rotates freely. The other benefit to having the undercut is it won't fall out. So, guys, I would suggest you put that on your model. That's a really good thing to have. Let's put that in a certain position and give it a little torque. Unloosen it. That's two. Let's see how close we got to hitting the center of that groove. I'd say that's a win. All right, let's move on to the actual slide itself. Wrap this video up. Next piece up, number 16, the tool slide. First feature on the part will be a full length channel on one side and that is strictly to relieve some of the stress that's in it for the critical dovetail that goes on the other side. So this is first, I will not put this undercut in or I will not put this notch in until after the fact. So we're gonna put the channel in first, flip it, we'll do all the work from the other side. There's a pocket, there's a dovetail. I guess there's a chamfer on it too. I didn't see that the first time around. All right, here we go, over to the mill. The first witness mark you see is strictly referenced. It's gonna be a full diameter, so watch for the circle. I lower the table immediately afterwards and then sweep the part looking for a track. That little straight track at the end is the zero point for the slot. It's not that the top of the part is inconsistent. I actually move the table, but it's so slight you really can't see it. Now I'll get close to my finished dimension with everything a couple thousandths away and to make sure that the cutter has no imminent load on it and will deflect and change what I think I'm getting. I'll dial everything in at the last minute so that the finished cuts are not only in the same direction in a climb cut, but the same load on the tool. And it is perfectly okay if you got to take two, three, four passes to get to your final dimension. Patience makes a good part. Don't rush it because you can't undo a mistake easily. Depending on the amount of load on the tool, since the bottom of the tool is true with the bottom of the slot, mill any other features on this part that are true with the bottom of the slot as well. If there's excessive load for the secondary cuts, back the table off a couple of thousands so you don't have cutter tracks. This is the little section that holds the tool bit that rocks back and forth as the ram oscillates across the part. The little part that goes in here, this brass piece is for the vertical adjustment for the depth of cut. Okay, let's flip it over to the back side. The part is inverted and it is sitting on the mating piece that's going to go in that slot that I just cut. So the sides are just a little bit above the parallel. The actual banking surface is that protrusion in the center, that little steel part right by my thumbnail. So I'm going to take a dust cut across the back, form the step that's required, and then I'll do the pocket work for the dovetail. 
The next few segments will be silent video at a certain accelerated video point. The software does not allow for any type of background noise. So uh, bear with. Although I really enjoy working with brass, sometimes the reflection is just a little too much, not only for the human eye, but for the camera. So a little bit of red Sharpie marker, highlighter, whatever you can put on there is really helpful to give you some idea where your cutter's at. Do not be afraid to mark all over your part. A little bit of isopropyl alcohol after the fact and it blows right off. Watch for the red to go away and you know you have your zero surfaces wherever you're headed. When you're creeping up on a surface, a piece of paper is a good idea. You can stick it in there. It's about three and a half thousandths thick, or about a tenth of a millimeter. And when it pulls the paper through, you can just gently tap on the dial, reset everything, and you know you have a zero surface. If your cutter is close to the finished size of your slot, be very careful when you change directions when pecking like this. One would be considered a conventional cut, the other would be considered a uh, climb cut, and you could leave some grooves in the end of the face. This is really a non-functional surface. It's a stop surface for a collar, so as long as the collar fits, you're in good shape. The relieved area up here in the front is for a collar that's going to hold the lead screw that comes through here. And the center section here is just relief for the dovetail undercut that I'm about to do. I will put a small recess step in the very bottom so that I can have a little bit more room taken out of there. You can see the channel shape that I just cut in. And the reflection is very deceiving. It makes the bottom look twisted, which I hope it's not, but it's yet to be seen. I may unloosen the vice pressure <laughs> just to see if it's going to pop. And then I'll re-indicate it if need be. Go back in there with the 075 cutter for the bottom. I think I'll do the cutter on the bottom first before I relieve any pressure from this setup. And the cut that I'm about to do will take this bottom chunk right here by my thumbnail, that square bottom, and it will put another little step in it. And that just relieves some of the pressure off the dovetail cutter. That'll go in there afterwards. Now if you have this kit and you are building this component, you're going to notice that the dovetail cutter that you're going to use probably will not fit in that relief that we just put in there. It only has to go to the center of the cutter, but here's the butt. Here's the butt. The major diameter of the piece that I just did in the last video is going to bump into the collar on that shaft long before the dovetail ever gets all the way to this end wall. So all of this stuff down here is pretty much just clearance. So don't worry if you have a little bit of remnant left over cutter profile on this end of the channel. That is okay. And trust me, I spent a couple hours analyzing all the interferences on this. So it will be okay, not a problem. Put a dovetail cutter in there and uh, keep our fingers crossed. Here we go. I have a sneaking suspicion that once this cut starts, it is going to get all kinds of sloppy and you're going to lose sight of the cutter. But make sure that you don't run the cutter into the firewall. It wouldn't hurt anything because it would be subsurface, 
but you would know it's there. So I'm going full depth on this 125 deep. I'm going to sweep back and forth a couple thousand. I'm going to use some pins and some feeler gauges to check the gap between the pins and hopefully match this feature to the part that I just did. Let's cross our fingers and do it. This cutter has a major diameter of 250. That's about six millimeters, six and a quarter millimeters, and it's got about 125 depth worth of cutting flute. And that little shank right there is 0.1. Two and a half millimeters, hundred thousandths. Now that's, that'll make your butt pucker. <laughs> There's no easy way to say that. That first pass is just full cut both ways. One side's climbing, one side is conventional. And uh, I tell you, if you don't hold your breath for the first pass on a cut like that, well, you're just a better man than I. Yeah, I wish we could get a better look at that, but I don't want to move anything on this setup. I just want to put my pins in there, check it out. I'll be right back. I will show you the final measurement. Now off camera I measured the radius on the tool and the radius that it left on the mating part and had to open this channel up to 155. If you guys are building this, 155. There is a radius on the dovetail cutter and the cutter is called out as a 250. But it measures at 248 and a half and it's got about a 10 thou radius, uh, maybe 5 thou on each corner, which makes it bigger. So I did not shift this cutter back and forth at all. These pins are held in place with a magnet, and by sticking the feeler gauge in between them and taking the wiggle out of the pin, I'll know exactly where the geometry of that slot is. And according to this, it should go together without any movement at all. So let's try it out. And I mean movement of the cutter, not necessarily movement of the part. I'm expecting this to have a couple of thousandths worth of play that I did not want. Not too bad. movement down and a half maybe nice and smooth though and I'm shocked that the diameter goes all the way to the wall I did use an undersized cutter for those corners and that may have helped all right now if it still stays together <laughs> don't open the vise with the pieces assembled do not do that the next feature in line is the 125 diameter through hole called out on the print. Now when you look at it, you're going to say, no big deal, I'll just ream that hole. But the 063 dimension on the print is given from a surface that's going to be very difficult. Well, not difficult, it's going to be easy to register from. But as far as uh, picking that up with a edge finder, well, that's going to be another story. Let's take a look at the setup. I'll show you what I did. Here is my setup. I will benefit... Uh, twofold by this setup. First of all, the inside face, that face in there, is where the dimension is given from. Sitting on a tall parallel like this, I can edge find off of this face and I'll know exactly where that face is. From there you can just do your math and find the hole. The exposure to the y-axis is back and forth, which is plenty of room to sweep it with an indicator and when it comes time to chamfer these corners, they are readily accessible. So let me get the indicator, let me get the edge finder, find my location, and we'll pop a hole in there. And the zero position was set off camera. So nobody calls me out on that. So 
This is just to demonstrate the sweep technique and the exposure of the part. That would be the X0. Now this one may be a little confusing to some. I do not like to move the table differently than I'm going to move to create the feature after I edge find. So if I'm creating a feature over here, I like to pull the table to the edge finder and then pull the table to the feature. It's just more accurate that way. Feature I'm looking for is 63 thousandths off of this face right there. Okay, guys, when it comes to doing the actual operation, I have a gauge block under the lip on the back side of the part so that the drill doesn't hit the parallel. I will make sure that my drill behaves and stays within the 125 boundary on the other side. That is fairly important. With the sides being properly and uh, correctly swept, I know I'm on center with my X. I'm going to pick up this face right here, zero that face on the digital, and then move towards the dimension given on the print. This should be relatively quick. It's a single hole. It's for the lead screw that moves the actual slide block itself. Let's do it. 200 thousandths diameter edge finder, 100 thousandths offset, 063 dimension. Once the edge finder kicks out, it's an 037 shift to the actual feature center line. One of the benefits of holding a part in this orientation is you can not only drill the end feature, drill and ream the end feature, but you can put the chamfers on after the fact without ever shifting the part. The only thing left to do to this part is put the pivot pin in for the clapper block, but I do not have the clapper block complete, so I'm going to take this out. We're going to deburr it, take a look at it on the bench, see if it fits where it should. Stick around. Finish tool slide. Pivot holes for the clapper block are not in. I will show that when I do the clapper block. Now this undercut right there you have to be real sure that the collar that goes in there, and that's the collar that goes in there, fits in that undercut. Because that is the retention feature for the lead screw that goes in there. This goes in there, it passes through the collar, set screw in the collar, goes down in that little detent. So that's the first thing I'm gonna do as far as the assembly is concerned. And this is gonna be fumble finger time, so I'm gonna zoom out and fast forward through this part. Once that collar is on, make sure that it rotates. If the screw head sticks out too far, take a little off the screw or make the counterbore in the lead screw a little deeper. But that has to spin. And you can recognize this little guy.
Now, I may have pointed this out earlier in this series, but the shoulder down here on this part here will run into this collar before this gets all the way up. Let's see if that's going to happen. Actually, I think the big diameter hits the collar first. Yep, there you go. If you want a little more range of motion on your slide, relieve the underside of this large part. Just a little bit bigger than this collar right here, and this should go all the way up. Make sure that you shorten this side of the inside feature accordingly, and you can pick up another eighth of an inch worth of travel on this. And when all said and done, this guy goes right here. And there you go. The only thing left to do on this assembly is the clapper block that goes right in this little unit here and the tool post assembly and this is complete hopefully that'll be in the next week ish before i can present that video but i had a lot of fun making this one this little dovetail thing is really critical and surprisingly enough the dovetail cutter that i bought did measure 250 across the bottom actually 248 and a half which i was all kinds of happy about but there was about a 10 thou radius on each one of the corners and when you did the math, that turned out to be about 258 plus across the very bottom projected edges. And that made the first one too loose. So believe it or not, I mean, who in their right mind would make that part over? <laughs> yep, me. So this one was about three thousandths too wide because I trusted the cutter and I got burned. If you're going to buy a commercial cutter, make sure you check it. Cutter was fantastic. It cut great. The geometry is outstanding, but the tangent diameter or the projected sharp edge diameter is not there. So there you go. Heartbreaker, but scrap pile. Never know when that compressor is going to kick on. Sorry for the lack of continuity in that. I was very much looking forward to doing this. This was a lot of fun. I like working with small dovetails like that. That can be quite challenging. Make sure you come up with a wire dimension or a pin dimension so that you can do it and everything goes together as planned. Handle fit like a glove. Looks good on there. And I would say that when all said and done, this little shaper model is probably right on par with the difficulty of the lathe. Maybe a little bit more. But that's all I got for you for today. I thank you very much for tuning in. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you are well and happy and safe. This is Joe Pye at Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas. I'm out.